discuss our top story. Five people, including three teenagers, have been shot in London in the past 24 hours. So far this year, 60 people have died violent deaths in the capital. In the whole of last year, there were 116 murders, not including those who died in terrorist attacks. What had been a steady decline in the murder rate from 2003, when there were more than 200 murders in the capital, went into reverse in 2013, when 110 people were killed. London is actually safer than other big cities. The latest figures from the Office for National Statistics show London had a homicide rate of 1.45 per 100,000 people. That includes manslaughter. Birmingham and the West Midlands had a rate of 1.76 and Glasgow had two. Greater Manchester had the highest number at 2.44 per 1,000. There is no one simple solution. It's a very complex problem. Let's talk about it. Joining us from central London is former gang member and now founder of the Safe and Sound Youth Project, Jennifer Blake, and in the studio here, former Met Police Detective Chief Inspector Peter Kirkham. Welcome to you both. Different areas of expertise, so this, this will be an interesting discussion. Peter, first of all, I want to start with you, the Mayor of London, blaming the government in part for what's going on because of funding. Is he right? I would absolutely agree with him. It's the first note I made on the bit of paper I brought in with me that the first duty of a government is to protect its citizens and it's patently obvious that this government isn't uh, and it's, it's failing in that duty by failing to provide sufficient police resources to keep the streets safe. Could the Mayor of London do more himself? The Mayor of London's done quite a bit. Uh, there's always arguments that they could move stuff away from transport or whatever. I don't understand exactly what the rules are around that, but I'm sure there are other things that people would make an argument for. But he's done a huge amount. Uh, he's moved back from having one um, officer per ward uh, in community policing in London to two. Um, and, and he's done what he can. He's found money for various things. Um, the big problem, but unfortunately that's just going to be a drop in the ocean compared to the overall budget cuts. The Met lost 600 million um, between 2010 uh, and 2016, I think it was, and it's now losing another 400 million between now and 2020. If you think things bad are, now, uh, are bad now, we're likely to lose another 1,500 to 3,000 police officers on the worst estimate. And the figure always says 10,000 fewer police officers than 2010, is that right? Uh, there's about 22,000 fewer police officers nationwide. The Met doesn't look like it's lost that many on paper, but there's actually been about a 20% reduction on divisional police. OK, Jennifer, to you, with regards to the numbers of police, is the, the lack or the fewer number of police on the streets a big issue within communities? It's part of the part of the issue, but I wouldn't say it's the bigger picture. Um, the bigger picture is that we've got a lot of young people that are in school, um, they're going into prisons, wherever, that's where the resources need to go. Our, our problem isn't the fact that we, because we ain't got enough police officers to have on each street corner to know that these things are going to happen. So to say that, okay, we need to put more police on the streets, yes, that's fine, because they are there to keep the community safe. But we have a duty as well as a community. Now, every time I come on, I always talk about that this is a safeguarding issue. And we're looking at the fact that we've got a lot of young people out there that, that, that they're being killed and they're killing each other. So for me, it's about how do we do that? How do we go into schools? Let's put our resources in the schools. Let's put our resources where the young people are. Let's put our resources in supporting parents, getting messages from parents. They don't know what to do anymore. How can they, how can they be helped? So, yes, policing on the streets, it does help, but that's not the bigger picture. Could funding be better targeted, a slight increase in police numbers and more funding into what Jennifer is talking about rather than just one or the other? We need both. It, it, it is, I, I don't argue that all we need is policing. I don't, I've got a whole list of things here, Cust, cuts to youth services, care services, especially for care leavers, councils, the CPS the courts, the probation service, youth offender teams, the list is almost endless mm -hmm. of all those other things that impact on people actually committing crime in the first place. The causes are socio-economic and those sorts of agencies are the ones that need to be working with uh, the people at risk to try and prevent them getting involved in crime in the first place. The police role is then dealing with the symptoms when those crimes, and some crimes will always happen, and keeping public space safe. Jennifer, can I ask you, one of the things that came up in our report on this earlier is the role of social media. There seems to be a little bit of argument as to how big a role social media plays in terms of 
gang feuds about likes and numbers of views on videos, some of the people we spoke to saying that that's not as big an issue as people think it is. The Met saying that actually it is a large part of it. What do you think? Well, but in regards to social media, it's about the young people using that as a platform to to create a music, to send messages out. But I wouldn't say that it's it's all in all. I heard the interview earlier, and and I will agree to disagree for the fact that at the end of the day, young people they're going to pay for so much to to actually go for a studio where we had a studio, and and young people just love to go there and create music and 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 have that. And yes, you've got the minor, the, the let's say the the minority of them that are actually actually using it as a platform to send out messages. But the messages are going to go out which, whichever way. So I wouldn't say that that kind of social media, you know, YouTube videos are the cause of it. I'd say that a lot of young people put themselves in danger for being part of that video um, and not really understanding that just their face alone being in there um, connects them to a certain gang. I want to ask you both this question. Jennifer, first, shootings this weekend, we've had five of them now. Where are these mainly kids getting guns? <laughs> well, do you know what? That's a question that, um, you know, that it needs answering, but I don't think I'm the right person to ask that um, because right now, at the end of the day, um, you know, we don't manufacture guns here. So, yeah. like I said, at the end of the day, the guns are coming in and, and you know what? That's not the problem. It's, it's the person that's picking up the gun that is the actual problem. It's but, not the fact that we've got guns. So ask you, Peter, where are they coming from? Um, I, I don't know. There needs to be some analysis done. There's probably been some analysis done already, and, and there will need to be more analysis done. Obviously, you can trace firearms to the source of origin, and then you can make sort of educated guesses of how they've got here. Uh, I very much suspect they're coming across borders. Um, I very much suspect that cuts to customs and to border uh, force checks are putting holes back in the system that we closed. We had this problem with firearms. Uh, being available to youngsters, 16-year-olds, whatever, on the streets, dealing with very low-level street crime, drug dealing and whatever, um, in the late 1990s when I was still investigating murders and we started Operation Trident to specifically deal with all that, get all that intelligence and try and cut off the supply. And, and the police had quite some success with that into the 2000s. And firearms involved at that level Yes, there's still some, but they really went all the way down. I suspect the attention has been taken away, the resources have been cut and it's growing again. Just like if you cut your grass um, last weekend, you're going to have to cut it again this weekend. If you ignore it, it'll turn into a jungle. OK, Jennifer, I just want to finish with you. Um, I, I don't want to generalise, but it seems to be young men. Um, some people would say, I suppose, that it's violent anger amongst young men. Other people would say it's lack of opportunity, um, disenfranchisement. Where do you stand there? Um, I stand for the fact that we've got a lot of angry young men, um, young people in general, and we mustn't forget about the girls' involvement in this as well. Um, they're the elephant in the room. Nobody don't want to speak about them, but they have a part to play too. But we've got a lot of young, angry young men out in our community, and like I said, there's a lack of opportunities for them. Um, parents are taken away from their um, ability to to discipline. So there's there's a load of stuff that is actually going on with our young men. And like I said, there's a lot of young people that are witnessing lots of murders and stabbings and you know there's there's no there's no support out there for them there's no counseling or so forth so we're, we're seeing this effect for a lot society has a lot to play as well mm. jennifer um blake and peter kirkham thank you very much both for your time appreciate thank it you.